Well, thank you all for coming out this morning on this beautiful February morning. I've got a great turnout for cars and coffee, and, and so if you partake to that, I hope you enjoy the coffee and the donuts. But one of our favorite things every month is our Tread Talks, and, and I'm really excited about this morning's presentation. We have with us Dan Minnick. A lot of you recognize Dan from here at the museum. But a little bit of background on Dan. Dan grew up around his father working on all sorts of unusual cars, which started his interest in the automobile industry and its history. He has worked as a technician for the local Dodge dealer, worked with his father at his father's automotive engine rebuilding facility, a former columnist for Engine Builder magazine, and a former contributor to allpar.com, a Mopar enthusiast website. Dan currently teaches at KSU's College of Business and Operations and Supply Chain. He's been a volunteer here at the Midwest Dream Car Collection since the beginning. His wife Sherry, I don't know if Sherry's in, Sherry's back there, I'd like to recognize Sherry. Sherry's our Events and Operations Director here at the museum. Uh, in addition to serving as a floor volunteer, Dan, for over a year now or so, has been our collection advisory team, which meets monthly to discuss the various vehicles, uh, what we want to purchase, what we want to borrow for a loan, what exhibits we want to show, and things like this. And so we're just so excited to have both Dan and Sherry on our museum staff and team here. So. Anyway, Dan's passionate about uh, uh, European cars, import cars, uh, anything along those lines. And so this Sunbeam does have a special place in Dan's heart. And I know he's going to give us a great presentation this morning for the Sunbeam Tiger II. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. So there's a study guide on your chair for the exam afterwards. So. <laughs> it, it's pretty fine print, apologize about that. There's a lot of info to cram on there. So the front, the front page is kind of a family tree of who is this company and what happened and wh where did they go? And then the back page is a list of uh, post-World War II Sunbeam models and then kind of a short who's who's list. Um, so when this car's out here on the floor, there's two questions that really get asked. Who in the world is Sunbeam and what happened to him? And other than we know that Shelby was involved in this, this particular one, but this story, and we could spend all day discussing this story. There's so many twists and turns in the Sunbeam story that it's, it's almost crazy. But I'm going to try and do, hopefully, get you out of here by 3 o'clock this afternoon, and we'll cover at least a little bit of it. So. This is the 1920 Sunbeam, 350 horsepower V12 Bluebird, world land speed record, 150 miles an hour, 1925. So it's not the first Sunbeam, but it's an early one. This is a 1977 Chrysler Sunbeam hatchback that you've never heard of. <laughs> um, an ad campaign by Petula Clark, um, put a Chrysler Sunbeam in your life. Her claim to fame was the 60s song, Downtown. Um, anyway, that's how Sunbeam ended up, pretty much. So, Sunbeam had a lot of history way back when. Today, nobody can tell you anything about them, but it was a big deal 100 years ago. Um, if you look at this, and this is just a short list, you look at these land speed records, 19. 24, 1925, 1926, 1927. Um, winners in the Alpine Rally in the 50s. Um, Sterling Moss drove Sunbeam Talbots and Sunbeam Alpines. Um, all kinds of interesting facts that are pretty much lost today. So where did, where did Sunbeam start? John Marston in Wolverhampton, England, um, he did uh, tin plating went into business for himself and was really successful in doing tin plating and he was an avid cyclist and the 1880s bicycles were a big thing and everybody was making bicycles and so he began making bicycles and the first bicycle he made it was painted black enamel and it really shone and according to legend his wife Ellen saw the bicycle and she goes Wow, look at how the sunbeams reflect on the paint. And that is the legend of where the sunbeam name comes from. Is that really true? We don't know. That's legend. Um, 
It's credited to Mrs. Marston. So Sunbeam was one of the finest bicycles you could buy. Marston's Sunbeam Bicycle Company, um, they were prosperous, they were successful, and his right-hand man convinced him, hey, motor cars are kind of the upcoming thing. Let's branch out into that. And so he partnered with um, uh, another guy called Maberly, and they built Sunbeam Maberly's. Starting in 1905, they established it as a separate entity. This is one of the early ones. It's kind of quirky. It's one wheel in front, one wheel back, two wheels in the center. Um, that's a very early Sunbeam Maberly. In 1909, a Frenchman by the name of Louis Cotelin joined uh, Marston Sunbeam Auto Company. He was an engineer, he was designer, and he was obsessed with racing and speed. And his um, quote was, racing helps improve the breed and puts every man on his metal. Meaning this is what's gonna really make things go and have the company take off. This is Louis Cotelin, or Louis Cotelin. Um, he actually uh, did a record of um, 93 miles an hour in, a, in one hour and in a car driven by him nicknamed Toodles, which was the nickname of his second wife, second out of four wives. Um, typical Frenchman, I guess. So, Cotelin continued to push for Sunbeam to go into racing. Um, they entered four Sunbeams in the French Grand Prix and the Coupe de Lotto in 1912. Cars came in first, second, and third in the Coupe de Lotto and third, fourth, and fifth in the Grand Prix. Instantly, Sunbeam was internationally known as, wow, this is a company that we need to sit up and pay attention to. 1912, Sunbeam Motor Car shares are listed and it becomes a publicly traded company. So, Cotelin is really driving this company at this point. Marston is just a shareholder and really kind of in the back picture, but this is really Cotelin's um, company that he's driving forward. Uh, they get involved in producing aircraft engines. Sunbeam Cotelin aircraft motors, um, numerous seaplanes and Bristol fighters were equipped with Sunbeam aero engines. Now, meanwhile, in Paris, a guy named Dirac, Alexander Dirac, set up a company to build automobiles and incorporated a holding company in London called A. Dirac so he could import and export much easier through a British holding company, but his name was Dirac. And also in London, a company was started, um, which is a whole other story, Talbot, by the Earl of Shrewsbury and Talbot funding it. And what happened is A. Duroc, this British holding company, acquires Talbot and Sunbeam and merges them all into a company called STD, which wouldn't fly today. <laughs> Sunbeam, Talbot, and Duroc. Now, Sunbeams were continued to be made at Wolverhampton, Talbot's in London, Duroc's in Surrennes, Paris, and what they really wanted was the Talbot name. Alexander Duroc was not involved in the company anymore, and they kind of rebranded Duroc as Talbot, or if you're French, Talbot. Um, they were called um, Talbot Duroc's for a while, then they just dropped the Duroc name. So there was some coordination between these separate companies, but they were all really left to be run independently, which is part of the problem here. Um, oh, racing development. Cotelin oversaw racing development for all three divisions. So he was, you know, like I said, racing obsessed. And he kind of oversaw that for Sunbeam, Talbot, and Duroc. This is a 1925 Sunbeam 3 liter. Now, Sunbeam continued to do racing and break records continually. This here um, is Henry Seagrave, who was a renowned race car driver in um, England at the time. In 1926, he raced this four liter Sunburn ti Sunbeam Tiger and did 156 miles an hour in 1926 in that. Cotelin and Bentley got into a disagreement at one of the races. Bentley said, there's no link between auto racing and what you sell on the street. 
Colin said, yes, there is. And there, and they had this little spat and disagreement. And can, but it was a friendly, friendly disagreement, but they were always competing against each other. Sunbeam was a household name, but in the 1920s, if you'd asked any schoolboy what car he would aspire to own, it was either Sunbeam or Bentley. Much the same today as we would think of Ferrari Lamborghini or something like to that effect. It was Sunbeam and Bentley were, were it. But uh, this STD group was beginning to have some financial issues and in 1924, they borrowed significant funds and nobody really knows what the purpose was, but most people believe it was to fund Kotalin's racing passion. This here is the uh, record-breaking Sunbeam Tiger that Henry Seagrave drove to 156 miles an hour. And this here, let me stop this quick. Um, before I play this. So this is a little video here on the next leap on what do we do to break the next record. And the goal is we're going to do 200 miles an hour. 1926. At the Sunbeam Motor Car Company in Wolverhampton, England, they were building a monster. The building shook each time it was started up. There was nowhere in Britain big enough to run it. Driver Henry Seagrave wasn't convinced he'd be able to control it. In the race to set the first 200 miles per hour speed record, Sunbeam were building a 1,000 horsepower car out of spare parts. The men who built it called it the Slug. In the US, they had a better name for it. They called it Mystery. The Sunbeam Motor Car Company was formed in 1905, born out of Englishman John Marston's successful bicycle business. French engineering genius Louis Cotillon joined the company as chief engineer in 1909, and the company was soon turning out innovative designs that saw success both on and off the track. With the advent of the First World War, Sunbeam also became a prolific manufacturer of aircraft engines, and by the end of the war, Cotillon had risen to be the company's joint managing director. Brooklyn's racer Henry Seagrave had set his first land speed record in 1926 at the wheel of a Sunbeam, only to see it broken just over a month later by John Parry Thomas driving Babs, an ex-Brooklyn's car now sporting a 27-litre Liberty Aero engine. Seagrave and Cotillon could see that whilst record-breaking could continue to bring valuable publicity to Sunbeam, future challenges would require a radical new approach. Sunbeam shareholders weren't so sure, and with minimal funds approved, Cotillon's only option was to build the new car from the company's parts bin. Sunbeam's chief engineer, Jack Irving, designed the new car, and construction began at Sunbeam's Moorfield Works in Wolverhampton in late 1926. In the corner of the workshop lay a pair of Sunbeam Matabele V12 aircraft engines, salvaged from a sunken powerboat. At 22.4 litres, each engine produced around 450 horsepower. Combining the two engines in one relatively crude steel chassis would provide 900 horsepower, although the car would be publicised as the 1,000 horsepower Sunbeam. The engines were too bulky to use side by side, and so Irving placed one ahead of the driver and one behind. The cockpit was offset to avoid the prop shaft that coupled the engines together, allowing Seagrave to sit low down within a sleek body that was tested in Vickers Wind Tunnel at Brooklands. As work continued on the car, Sunbeam's engineers began referring to it as the slug. Irving's design featured a tubular frame onto which was mounted a slab-sided body with front and rear curves designed according to the latest aerodynamic thinking. Irving had managed to keep the frontal area of the car as low as possible, and a figure of 18.7 square feet resulted in a drag coefficient of 0 0.34, fairly slippery even by today's standards, but revolutionary in 1926. The huge Matabele engines were cooled by three radiators, one in the nose for the front engine and two in the sides for the rear. Exhaust for the front motor exited through the body sides with louvers in the top to help heat escape. Twelve exhaust stubs behind the driver serviced the rear engine. When the car was run up on a test stand in the workshop, as the building shook, the noise from the 24 cylinders was described as shattering. Seagrave, watching the test, said afterwards, it is the only time I can honestly say when I have stood in front of a car and doubted human ability to control it. Although Sunbeam had been using shaft drive in all its racing cars since 1910, 
Irving was concerned at the prospect of running 900 horsepower through a conventional rear axle, and so a three-speed gearbox would turn the rear wheels using drive chains. Thick steel was used around the rear wheels to contain a flailing chain if it broke free. On the test stand, with the wheels spinning under power, the chains could be seen glowing red hot. When complete, the 1,000 horsepower sunbeam stood 23.5 feet long and 6 feet wide, and weighed around 4 tonnes. Top speeds in each gear were predicted to be 74, 139 and 212 miles per hour, with the engines using a gallon of fuel per minute. Thanks to the twin-engine design, Seagrave would have 28 instruments to monitor on the car's dashboard, including six oil pressure gauges and four rev counters. As he remarked, I won't be bored. The car was rolled out of the workshop on the 21st of February 1927, days after Malcolm Campbell had raised the record to 174.88 miles per hour in his new Bluebird. Seagrave gave the Sunbeam the briefest of test runs on the factory's roads. In fact, it ran for just 300 yards before it was carefully packed in a huge wooden crate ready for Daytona. With Seagrave aiming at 200 miles per hour, it was felt that recent British sites for speed records, Pendine Sands in Wales and Southport Beach in northwest England, would not offer enough room to run a car that would need four and a half miles to accelerate, a measured mile for the record, and a further four and a half miles to stop. Although the 20-mile beach at Daytona looked ideal, running the car in the US meant that British sponsors were reluctant to back the record attempt, and Seagrave ended up paying for much of the trip to the US himself. Seagrave was warmly welcomed at Daytona. This was, after all, the first of the famous British speed kings to attempt a record in the US. He'd managed to secure a working arrangement between the AAA who would time the event and the AIACR, the forerunner of the FIA, who then, as now, would ratify the world land speed record. Despite the lack of testing before sailing for America, Seagrave's team made very few changes to the car in Daytona. After just two trial runs on the beach, alterations were made to the steering gear and newly lined brake shoes were needed after the original aluminium shoes melted. When Seagrave's helmet was almost torn from his head by buffeting at speed, a deflector was added to the cockpit. Although the streamlined spats over the rear wheels were thought to add 5 miles per hour to the car's top speed, it was decided that easy access to check the drive chains and avoid the risk of entanglement if a tyre burst were more important factors, and so the car would run without them. Once further issues with the gear selectors and engine cooling had been sorted, the car and the team were ready for the record attempt. On March the 29th, 1927, huge crowds gathered on Daytona Beach to watch Seagrave and the car America had christened Mystery, the 1,000 horsepower Sunbeam. Compressed air bottles started the rear engine before it was used to turn over and start the front motor. In the first of the car's three gears, Seagrave moved off gently towards the start line, where he accelerated hard towards 200 miles per hour. In windy conditions, only Seagrave's skills saved him when the car skidded for 400 yards and hit several marker flags before he lifted the throttle as he left the measured mile. As it neared the end of the beach, the Sunbeam's brakes failed to slow the car, and quick thinking by the ex-Brooklands racer saw Seagrave head for the shallow water, running the car through the surf until it was back under control. As he came to a halt on the beach, Seagrave could sense the record was close. The wheels and brakes were changed, the drive chains were checked, and the Sunbeam roared off back down the beach well within the mandated one-hour time limit. This time, a tailwind ensured the run was even faster, at 207 miles per hour. As Seagrave rolled to a stop and people crowded round him on the beach, the news spread quickly. A two-way average of 203.792 miles per hour through the mile. Seagrave and the 1,000-horsepower Sunbeam, built out of spare parts for next to nothing, had smashed Campbell's existing record, raising it by almost 30 miles per hour. Campbell would come to Daytona himself the following year and take the record back, but for now, Henry Seagrave was the fastest man alive, and the first to 200 miles per hour. In the end, Seagrave had made it look easy at Daytona. With just a handful of runs up and down the beach, he had raised the world land speed record by the biggest margin in history. For the next eight years, British and American speed kings would regularly duel for land speed honours at Daytona, before the salt flats at Bonneville eventually beckoned. The great red car provided a huge amount of publicity for Sunbeam. It made a triumphant appearance at Brooklands in June 1927, touring the famous circuit powered by the rear engine alone, before it was transported to London 
and put on display at famed department store Selfridges, where thousands of people took the opportunity to view the fastest car in the world for themselves. Having covered just 75 miles under its own power, it is now on display alongside other famous land speed cars at the National Motor Museum, Bewley, in the south of England. So, Sunbeam was the first car to ever go 200 miles an hour. Most people don't know that, but in 1927, they did it. And it is now, if you go to the National Motor Museum in England, in Hampshire, it is on display there and you can see the actual mystery, or slug as they called it. Speed records are great, but they don't pay the bills. And this is a quote from Nick Baldwin, who wrote A to Z History of Sunbeam. He said, vast amounts of money were misspent on a fabulously successful racing and land speed record program, which a firm making only a thousand cars a year, and few of them aimed at sporting customers, could ill afford. Virtually everything was made in-house, necessitating 30 acres of factory floor space, up to 4,000 employees, too many models, including everything from overhead cam sports cars to straight eight limousines, constituted a recipe for disaster which duly arrived in 1935. So after the world speed record, um, Kotlin spent more and more time in France. STD moved the racing department to France. Um, Sunbeam becomes more reliant on the British Talbot for development. Um, Price Waterhouse comes in, financial situation is not looking good, not enough coordination between the brands, you need to centralize, you need to coordinate stuff. Um, a committee said the board needs new blood, the board promptly resigned. Kotlin sells off his shares, which he then invests in Lockheed and retires, retires to the Isle of Capri. Um, but 1934, those uh, 1924 loans were ten, due, 10 years now due, and the board is unable to repay or refinance. So, the cure for STD. Sell-off or bankruptcy, and bankruptcy. So, British Talbot was still strong in sales and profitable. It was sold to the Roots Brothers. The French factory, making Talbots, which used to be Duroc, was sold to the plant manager in France, Anthony Lago, and henceforth those cars would be known as Talbo Lagos. Some of Sunbeam's commercial bus operations were sold to the Roots Brothers. As for Sunbeam automobiles, sales were minimal, but the key asset was the brand name. That had a lot of equity behind the name. And William Lyons of SS Cars, which we now know as Jaguar, he developed this new sports car, the SS100. SS was getting bad connotations of using those letters in the 1930s. He wanted a new name for it. And he thought, hey, I should buy the rights to the Sunbeam name. However, the Roots Brothers, already having bought Talbot, did an end run around it and acquired the Sunbeam brand name. So, William Lyons was a bit upset. He chose the name Jaguar instead. Had things worked out differently, we would be seeing Sunbeam XJ6s, I guess, today. But didn't happen that way. So Roots Brothers, who are the Roots Brothers, Roots Group? So your little cheat sheet kind of shows Roots Brothers in red there and all their acquisitions. And it's, it's pretty convoluted. It's complicated to look through. but. They had become one of the world's largest auto dealers and distributors. They acquired Humber, Hillman, and they acquired office headquarters at Devonshire House in Piccadilly, which is pretty prestigious property right across from Buckingham Palace and the park. Reggie and Billy Roots. Each brother was strong where the other one was lacking. Um, Billy, the one on the right, says, I think up the ideas, and then Reggie tells me whether they will work. Reggie was the accountant mindset, Billy was the sales person, and Billy always said, I am the engine, Reggie's the steering and brakes. And that combination worked well for them, because each had what the other lacked, and they could trust each other, they were brothers, they worked well together, and they were some of the most respected voices in British motor industry for half a century. And I've got a couple quick pictures here. Billy Roots, 
there, second from the left. This is at the Berlin Auto Show in 1939, and some guy with a funny mustache is admiring the latest Sunbeam Talbot. This is, uh, over here on the left, King George VI, the Queen Mother Elizabeth, and Billy Roots, and then here Reggie Roots is shaking King George's hand after some event. This is Brian Roots' wedding. This is Brian Roots, Billy's son, Billy on the left, and in the center are Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret, who were at the wedding. This is Billy Roots and some guy from Missouri telling jokes together. This is Prince Philip, Billy Roots, and Vice President Nixon at the New York, New York World's Fair. So I show those to kind of show these guys were well, well connected, well respected. So Roots acquires Talbot and the Sunbeam name. And Talbot in France, or Talbot, is Talbot Lago, and this whole thing is now seeming confusing to buyers, and so Roots have this idea, well, let's just make a new brand and call it Sunbeam Talbot, and that will alleviate some of the, con the confusion. Um, basically, they were Talbots that they were producing until they started combining them with their Hillman and Humber operations and started sharing more and more parts. This is the um, Sunbeam Talbot 10 from like the late 30s. This here is the first post-war car, the Sunbeam Talbot 80 and 90. And they continue racing. Uh, Norman Garad, who was competition director for Talbot, came, came with the company and he recruited several drivers. Um, of them, Sterling Moss, Sheila Van Damme, she's a whole other interesting story. She was a pilot, uh, aircraft pilot in uh, World War II. Um, that's actually her racing there in a Sunbeam Talbot 90. Numerous wins. The Sunbeam Talbot 90 won international alpine rallies, 48, 49, 50, 52. This is Sterling Moss here on the left, on the top picture in the 1952 Monte Carlo rally. Sheila Van Dam on the left, Norman Garad, competition director. That name will come up later here in a little bit. 1954, they, there's still confusion on this whole Talbot or French Talbot Lago thing, and they drop the Talbot name, and Roots are just going with Sunbeam as a brand. A two-seat, so they take the, the Talbot 90 convertible, and they hire a designer called Raymond Lowy. Some of you Studebaker fans will be familiar with that name. He's very involved with Roots, as we'll see over the years. Um, so they can transform it into a two-seater, and they call it the Sunbeam Alpine, since they'd won Alpine Rally four years. And this car, one of its most famous appearances, is in Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief. And there's a beautiful blue convertible that Grace Kelly and Cary Grant are tearing around the French Riviera in, um, Sunbeam Alpine. And her quote, have you ever seen any place in the world more beautiful? She says that as she overlooks the city of Monaco. Infamous words, maybe prophetic. Winning continues. So here's Sterling Moss and Sheila Van Dam, record-breaking Sunbeam Alpine in Belgium. They exceeded 120 miles an hour in that. Billy Roots showing numerous racing trophies that um, Sunbeam has continued to win and other, other Roots products. 1955, Roots launches a new replacement for that old 80-90 Sunbeam and it's called the Rapier. They've used Raymond Lowy for designs. Um, there's some murkiness on did he actually design this or did they just use him for inspiration, but you be the judge. This is Lowy's 53 Studebaker Starliner. If you look at the back window and the curve, this is Sunbeam Rapier. And there's a lot of similarity in, in either design copy or Lowy did it. Sunbeam Rapier continues to win rally wins. Um, Rapier had over 40 class or outright wins from 56 to 63. And in 1955, Roots grows. 
They associate, um, acquire the company Singer, which was another British manufacturer, kind of slotted in between Hillman and Humber in their pecking order. Hillman was base, much like GM. You had Hillman, Singer, Sunbeam, Humber. Um, Roots was number four, and they were pretty close to being number three in, in the UK, in Britain, in the 1950s and early 60s. And there's the Roots logo from that era. Hill, Humber, Hillman, Singer, Sunbeam, Carrier, Commer. Carrier and Commer were commercial truck vehicles. 1959, that Alpine that um, Grace Kelly drove around, it needs replaced. So they took the floor pan of a Hillman Husky and they develop a new sports convertible from it. This is unit body, one of the first unit body sports convertibles to be produced several years ahead of uh, both MG and Triumph, as MGA and Triumph TR3 were both body on frame at the time. The B wouldn't come out to MGB wouldn't come out till 62, and Triumph didn't go unit construction until the 70s, really. And now, joining the highly successful range comes the new Roots creation, the new Sunbeam Alpine, proudly bearing the title of its famous predecessor. A new one and a half liter sports car in the Sunbeam tradition, styled in the most modern manner. The new Alpine comes with open or hard top body in carnival red, thistle gray, moonstone, glen green, a shade of British racing green, the international color, and lustrous embassy black. And now the new member of the great family bears the hard won title Alpine, a sporting car of fine quality, bred to go fast and stop fast. Here is grace and elegance of line. See how those tail fins follow from the harmonious flow of the speed lines of the body. Distinctive front end, low swept for vision and streamlined to cheat the wind. Very neat headlamp treatment too. See those wide doors. With the top up, this is a virtual coupe with safety glass winding windows eliminating rattles and drafts. Clever arrangement of the instruments on a smart fascia panel and twin bucket seats to stop side sway on fast corners, foam rubber cushioned. And there's a full seven inches of fore and aft adjustment for the driver and plenty of headroom too. So, this new Alpine, which looks pretty similar to this, except it's got tail fins on that, they hired Kenneth Howes, a young industrial designer who had worked for Raymond Lowy. And he also had uh, went to America and worked for Studebaker in South Bend and then went to Ford where supposedly he worked on a Thunderbird in the 1950s. Roots hired him away and if you know that this designer worked for Ford on the Thunderbird in the 50s, there's some similarities there. This, the primary target for this was export to the U.S. We're going to export this Alpine to the U.S. Um, it's got tail fins. It's got the, it's the first British car to have sports car to have wind-up windows. You know, we're really targeting U.S. market with this car. Billy Roots loved product placement, whether it was intentional or accidental. They did tons of product placement, and 1961. If you've ever seen the movie Butterfield 8 with Elizabeth Taylor, uh, which she won an Oscar for Best Actress, she meets her end in a crash of her Sunbeam Alpine, and now I just ruined the ending for you, but um, it's, it's one of the phenomenal car crash scenes of, of history, so she drives a Sunbeam Alpine. And then in 1962, a film franchise is launched, and the first movie is called Dr. No, James Bond's first car, was not an Aston Martin. It was a Sunbeam Alpine. Nineteen sixty seven, if you've seen the movie Pretty Poison with Anthony Perkins and Tuesday Weld, Sunbeam Alpine is what they're driving around um, causing trouble in. The Alpine had a four cylinder engine, fifteen hundred CC, 
1960, the Series 2, they bumped it up to almost 1600 cc. Here's production line for the Alpine at that time. And in, by 1962, and you know that Sunbeam is still serious in racing and doing this, and there's some race car drivers, um, one of them specifically named Ken Miles, uh, hanging out in Riverside, California. He's a Brit, some of you recognize that name. Uh, he actually uh, won class in Class F in production British sports car and Class F was pretty highly competitive. Um, Porsches were competing against them but Ken Miles was able to win in a Sunbeam Alpine. By October of 62 and this story there's lots of versions of the story but according to Ian Garrod, now I remember Norm Garrod who was the competition director his son Ian is also working for Roots Group and he's the USA West Coast sales director. And he said they were sitting around after a race, Jack Brabham, famous race car driver, Bruce McLaren, Ken Miles, and others had just driven Alpines, endurance three hour race, and the Cobra, Shelby Cobra had just been released. And Ian Garrod says, Jack Brown and I were just kind of talking and we said, well, what if we could put a V8 in this Alpine? If AC can do that, Shelby put a V8 in his, well, let's see if we can do that to our Alpine. Did some measurements. Ford small block is very small, compact externally, and let's see if that will fit. And so they did a contract with Shelby American to put a V8 in an Alpine. However, and, and here the story goes that Ken Miles and Ian Garrod were kind of impatient with Shelby working on this. So Ken Miles said, well, let me just see what I can do. And so Ken Miles takes a 260 Ford with the automatic and stuffs it in an Alpine. It's mounted high up. It's, it's crude. It's kind of a monster and this is the actual Ken Miles prototype Sunbeam Alpine with the tail fins. It is in um, Fred Phillips personal collection in Calgary currently but Ian Grodd and Ken Miles take this down LA Freeway and it actually works. Now they modified it a little bit so they could get the engine to fit but they said okay but let's go with this and Garad pays Miles $800 for the engine swap and the weight was too far forward but it did, it did work okay. So Shelby finally gets done with his prototype and this is the Shelby prototype and it was more of a finished effort. They pushed the motor back further, back under the firewall. Um, they put rack and pinion steering in it, got rid of the recirculating ball and um, they called it the Thunderbolt and Ken Miles was racing it, testing it, seeing if, you know, sorting out the suspension, seeing if it would work. After about 5,000 miles of testing, they shipped the prototype to England in the hold of a Japanese fruit freighter and this was all kind of a secret thing. It arrives in England and Lord Billy Roots tests it. All the executives drive it, think it's great. Billy, the story, a couple stories are that Billy Roots says, well, um, have, have my chauffeur follow me in the Humber limbo in case this thing breaks down. But then he promptly took off with it and left the limo driver in the dust. So Ian Garrod, after, after they do this showing to the executives in England, Ian Garrod brings this car back to Shelby and says, well, let's try, see if you can put more power into it. And they actually put a high performance 289 in which will just bolt in but it's really the only um, Tiger slash Alpine that had the high performance 289. Um, they do install it. This here is the purchase order from Roots to Ford to actually purchase a 289 engine for $463.45 signed by Ian Garrod. This here is a ledger from Shelby Americans spring of 1964 and there's two key things I know it's hard to see here but one here is $8,000 the 
developed Sunbeam 260 racing car, which was Shelby putting that motor in. And then here is the swap out of the 289 in the Sunbeam for $246 in labor. So it was originally called Thunderbolt. They took it to the New York Auto Show and decided to name it after one of those early race cars that Henry Seagrave drove in the 20s, the Tiger. And they call it Tiger. Here is um, Carol Shelby, I Lee Iacocca, Vice President of Ford, and John Panks, Managing Director of Roots. Um, they get orders over two and a half million pounds um, placing on the car at the New York Auto Show. They decide to put it into production. Now, meanwhile, back at Devonshire House, corporate for Roots, financial troubles. They launched a new line of cars. They kept the old line of cars in production, led to higher production costs. There was a strike, one of the worst strikes that British auto industry had had up to this time at British Light Steel Pressings, which was the steel plant Roots Group used. Billy Roots kind of refused to give in to the strike. And then they also launched the Hillman Imp, a small rear engine car. They got loans from the British government. The British government said, you need to put this factory up in Scotland, which is away from all the other supply chain issues, creating logistics costs. These three things led to some really financial troubles. Chrysler at the time is looking to get into Europe, wanting to be a big player along with Ford and GM. So Chrysler has already bought some shares into the French company Simca, which ironically had acquired defunct Talbot Lago or Talbot Lago in the late 1950s. And Billy's sons, Jeffrey and Brian say, well, let's talk to Chrysler. They're interested, they have deeper pockets. And in April of 64, Root sells 30% of voting shares, 50% of non-voting shares. So Root's family still has control. And a quote from Lord Billy Root says, I just hope we have done the right thing, but I, might fe but I feel we may all regret to the involvement with Chrysler. So the Tiger gets launched kind of in the midst of all of this. And the Alpine Series 4, so they put a new grill on it, a single bar. The Alpine has the 1600 cc. They clipped the fins. Um, as you'll see here, these don't, this doesn't have the earlier really pointy fins. They've clipped the fins to kind of update it. And the Tiger gets a little logo that says, powered by Ford 260. Shelby hopes to get the contract to build these. There's some discussion about that. Billy Roots doesn't feel like that's the right move. He feels like Shelby has too many ties to Ford. And Roots doesn't have facilities for it, but Jensen Company has facilities, extra space. So they contract with Jensen and modify Alpines to put the Ford V8 in them and make Tigers out of them. Several changes they make. So they move the battery to the trunk, they put the rack and pinion in, they reshape the, the fender well inside, they cut out the X-frame. A lot of it was done really crudely at Jensen's factory. The first 56 Tigers have Ford side loader transmission. After number 57, a Ford top loader. They have a Dana 44 solid rear axle made in UK. And Shelby gets a royalty on every one sold for development of this. And that is pretty much the end of Shelby's development and involvement with it. Um, Roots slash Chrysler kind of in the seat now is calling the shots and they develop this and target the US. They make um, 3,700 in the first um, couple years of the Mark I, the Mark I-A, they build 2,700. Not a big volume player, okay? Um, the Series I-A has a little bit different square doors than the original one, um, some added cabin ventilation, some slight updates. And here's a couple ads, and I've got some copies of the ads you can look at over here on the table, but this one they actually use Carol Shelby in. Um, grab a tiger by the wheel um, and hold on, it's alive. This one is interesting. Uh, you're too cool to be wild. I love you big man, you're a tiger. That was a US ad. This one was a UK market ad, which 
they didn't target really the UK much with it. They mostly wanted to send them to the US. But they continued doing racing. Ken Miles raced Sunbeam Tigers. Um, this is actually Ken Miles here at number 74. Um, Miles drove the whole race. He won um, the B Car production class and actually finished second overall to a Shelby Cobra. By 1964, the end of 64, Billy Roots passes away. Brother Reggie assumes chairmanship, and William Lyons makes a fitting statement, a dynamic worker not only for the British motor industry, for the country as a whole. And we're assuming they got over the squabble over who got the Sunbeam name. But 1965, um, they do some updates. Alpine Series 5 gets a larger motor, the four-cylinder. And since Chrysler's involved now, they try and figure out, you know, this has a Ford, the Tiger has a Ford motor. How can we put a Chrysler V8 in it? And it does not fit. Ford small block is much smaller externally. Distributors in the front, Chrysler small block V8, distributors in the back, and they've got this shoved up under the firewall. There's really no way to make a Chrysler V8 fit. So, and this is, comes from Roy Axe's autobiography. He says, lots of studies were done. Well, let's design a new Tiger. This is actually one of the promising replacement models that was sketched, um, but was dropped due to lack of budget. 1966, this is an internal memo at Roots Group. Effective February 1st, 1966, all Roots, stars to, Roots cars to have the Pentastar logo installed. And if you've had a 1960s Chrysler, there's a little gold star on the passenger side down here. And executive order that all Roots Group, Hump, Hillman's, Humber, Sunbeam, Singers would have the star on the right front fender. Tiger Mark II, which is what this is here. So Ford has actually ended production of the Ford 260 back in 64. Um, they finally used up all the stocks of the Ford 260, so Ford's supplying a 289, which just bolts right in. They be, so they put the 289 in the Series 2, and sales volumes are just not there for it. And so they bring over Don Lander from Chrysler North America to see what we can do. We don't have funds for any bodywork changes. Um, that Chrysler-powered replacement that was Corvette-looking, no funds for that. Um, Don suggests stripes. Those are popular in the U.S. Head designer at Roots, Roy Axe says those are ugly. Um, but the Americans get the stripes, which this one has on the side. And they, get the, they add the chrome around the wheel lip. That's added for the Series 2. They take off the rubbing chrome strip down the side. And they change the, the badges on the side. And it's a subtle thing, but the badges used to say, powered by Ford. Now they just say Sunbeam V8 because you don't want a Chrysler selling a car saying powered by Ford. This is a Canadian market ad for the Tiger Series 2. It's got the egg crate grill. The earlier ones just had the single bar. The Series 2 has the egg crate grill. So this is all, all these little small changes are done to try and let's boost up sales in the U.S. But by mid-1967, they've only cranked out 500 of these, and volume is just not there. And honestly, at this point, this is almost a 10-year-old design. Convertibles, the writing's kind of on the wall in the U.S. that convertibles are on the way out, and they pull the plug on the Tiger. They also, Chrysler also kills off the big Humber sedans. Um, Roots family sells off the remaining shares to Chrysler. Reggie Roots steps down. And then by January of 68, the Alpine ends production as well. Now, the replacement for this really is totally unheard of in the US. And that is the new Rapier. Roy Axe designed this. This car launches in 1967. 
Roy Axe says this is not related or inspired by the first Plymouth Barracuda, no matter what anyone says, even though Chrysler's in control. That's his words. He designed it. We'll have to take his word for it, I guess. But yeah, lots of people have said, okay, yeah, that's just a shrunken Barracuda. They um, do a performance version of this called the H120, which is still four cylinder, but it has dual Webers. It has um, more performance, not really targeted toward the US. Chrysler's in control and it's like, okay, we're, we're selling cars in the US, we're making them in the US anyway, why are we trying to send them over from England? And they launch a cheaper version of the Fastback and use the Alpine name on it. What they do spend money on over there is a compact four-door sedan called the Hillman Avenger. You know it over here as a Plymouth Cricket. That actually was a fairly good seller in the UK. A performance version of it is launched in 72 called the Avenger Tiger. So Plymouth Cricket Tiger, I guess, yeah. The Alpine name gets reused by the mid-70s um, on a mid-sized front-wheel drive sedan as the Chrysler Alpine, or if you're in France, it's the Simca. And by 1976, Hillman, Sunbeam, Singer, Humber, all those names are scrapped in the UK and they put Chrysler nameplates on everything. And they need to replace this Sunbeam Imp and Hillman Imp, so they take a rear wheel drive Avenger, they shorten the wheelbase, and they style it to look, it's rear wheel drive, they style it to look like the newly launched Horizon, which was developed in England by formerly Roots. Roy Axe designed it. Chrysler is having issues in the late 70s, financial troubles, and decides to sell the whole European operation. They sell it to Peugeot for a dollar, and Peugeot assumes all debts. Peugeot has this hodgepodge of Chrysler Simca Sunbeam stuff. They dig up a name from the past and rebrand everything, Talbot. So this is the Talbot Sunbeam. This is the last Sunbeam, so to speak. They actually do some rallying with it. And this is a Lotus engine, Talbot Sunbeam. They actually won the WRC championship in 1981 with it. But Peugeot cannot get traction with this Talbot brand. Um, and they finally wind the Talbot brand down by the mid 80s. And that's where it ends, except Peugeot merges with Fiat Chrysler to become Stellantis, and now it's all back in the same pot. And I don't know who owns, I've tried looking up who owns the rights to Sunbeam to Tiger, and it's really murky, but will there be a resurrection of it? I don't know. Here's, here's a couple emblems and badges over the years. The Roots logo, this is what Chrysler used in the 60s, 70s. This is actually when Peugeot bought and replaced Chrysler Simca with the Talbot brand. It's gone through some changes. Any, qu any questions? Yes. Not, not unexpected, are the hood louvers stock or is that? I believe they are. Because they didn't appear in most of the photos. I think, I think that's a series two thing. Do you know Doug for sure? I don't. <clears throat> My understanding is that everything on this, when Brad Jenkins restored it, he said it was all factory correct. So. Yeah, the, the, the guys that restored this are some of the experts. And there's lots of clones of these. People have taken Alpines and stuffed Ford V8s in, but I guess there's some quirky little things that you can look for to tell. Back, yeah. Just a comment, really. Uh, if you look at any of the old British movies up through about 19. 65, something like that. All the police cars were Humbers. Yeah. Um, I didn't show the whole uh, Dr. No clip with James Bond. What's interesting is that funeral car that's chasing him is a LaSalle, but when it goes over the cliff, it's a Humber. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and if you're quick, you can you go, hey, that's not exactly the same car. But, but then they made a wise choice, I think, and they switched to Ford Zephyrs with V6s in it that ran a whole lot faster yeah. than Humbers did. 
Anything else? Well, I guess you're ready for the quiz. Why don't you get in and fire it up? Okay. to drive out on the road. This is a convertible. The hard top comes off as a soft top convertible or the hard top. And, uh, so anyway, we acquired this car about a year ago at an auction we went to and our just thrill us number four, I believe, out of the 530 some came off the assembly line, uh, restored by Brad Jenkinson, who is, like uh, Dan mentioned, uh, foremost uh, authority on these vehicles and restorations. And, he said everything on it is numbers matching, factory correct. Thank you all for coming. Come check out the car. <laughs> <laughs>